Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tank. My name is Alan. While Darth Sidious is best known for dealing a massive blow to the Jedi Order with Order 66, fewer people seem to understand his role in destroying an ancient Sith decree known as the Rule of Two. You see, during the Old Republic era, the Sith generally won more battles than they lost against the Jedi. But the problem was whenever the Sith destroyed their perceived enemies, that temporary alliance that held the various factions of the Sith together would usually fall apart and result in a civil war and more infighting, which of course will allow the Republic and the Jedi to regain their upper hand against the Sith. The Rule of Two, created by Darth Bane, stipulates that in order for the Sith to survive, there must only be two Sith Lords at a time in the galaxy. You have a master who controls all the knowledge and power of the dark side, and an apprentice who yearns to learn and eventually take that power from the master by killing him. This is kind of a strange system because it depends a lot on Sith masters passing their knowledge down to the next generation so the Sith ideology never dies. The only problem is Sith Lords are rarely known for being selfless, and more than a fair share of Masters would take nefarious actions to make sure their dominance over their apprentice was complete. Darth Sidious, however, was never under the illusion that he was serving some greater cause or mission. He never saw himself as a tool or a mentor to help keep the Sith ideology alive. Instead, he believed that the Sith should be serving him as the Sithari. What exactly is the Sithari? Well, here is the Sithari prophecy from the Book of the Sith. The Sithari will be free of limits. The Sithari will lead the Sith and destroy them. The Sithari will raise the Sith from death and make them stronger than before. Sithari in the Sith native language basically means Lord or Overlord. The individual who became the Sithari was kind of like the Dark Side's version of the Chosen One. This was an almost godlike entity, a perfect being. Before we continue, I got an amazing deal from our sponsor for today's video, Onasaber.com. Right now, it's buy one, get one free, as in buy one Padawan Saber, and you'll get an additional Padawan Saber for free, as long as they're both the same model and have the same soundboard. This amazing deal ends on April 7th, so act quick. For those of you who don't know, Onasaber.com has a wide selection of awesome looking replica lightsabers from all of your favorite characters, plus many original designs. And they are always updating their inventory, and recently they just added the Brick Bundle which features the Lego-inspired brick saber and comes with a scabbard and display stand. Check out the link down below for more information. And if you guys aren't interested in the Padawan buy one, get one free deal, then you can still use our promo code. That's uh, TECH, all caps, for an additional 20% off. Thank you for your patience. On to the rest of the video. And with this mindset, Palpatine had no desire to share his power with anyone. And if we take a look at the three main apprentices he took, Maul, Dooku, and Skywalker, we begin to see that each individual was chosen for a very specific skill or talent they possessed. Palpatine never intended to train these guys to the point where they could actually kill him. Maul was an extremely stealthy Sith assassin. He was kind of the perfect tool for Sidious when the Sith were still in hiding. And Darth Vader, who was very emotional and easy to control, was the perfect enforcer for his empire. But the individual I want to highlight today is Count Dooku. The Jedi Master who would leave the Order and eventually become Darth Sidious's apprentice. Today, I want to take a look at the real reason why Sidious chose Dooku. And it has a lot with Sidious's struggle with Yoda. Right away, I'm suspicious of Palpatine's intentions. Count Dooku was born in around 102 BBY. By 32 BBY, he had already executed Jedi Master Yaddle and joined the Sith Order. This makes him 70 years old, very close to the life expectancy of the average human being when he becomes Palpatine's apprentice. It is clear by choosing someone this old, Palpatine doesn't really have to worry about overtraining Dooku because most likely he'll die from natural causes within a few decades anyway. Now, a lot of you will point out that the main reason why Palpatine chose Dooku was not because he needed an apprentice, but because of Dooku's very specific background. Dooku is a part of a noble family from the planet of Serrano, and Serrano is a really important world in the Outer Rim. As a young Jedi, Dooku always exhibited a sense of confidence and determination that some say might have led to ambition. This combined with his royal blood meant that Dooku could become quite a powerful political figure should he leave the Jedi Order. It also didn't help that Dooku was striking, tall, an older gentleman with a soft, deep voice that carried very well in large auditoriums. A key part of Palpatine's plan of taking over the galaxy was exploiting the cultural, political, and economic differences between the Outer Rim in the core regions of the galaxy, and Serrano was kind of a big player as far as the Outer Rim was concerned. And so having Dooku, a son of Serrano, lead a separatist movement was really the perfect move by Palpatine. And Dooku, well, he really stepped up to the task. I do want to point out that it is very interesting that Palpatine immediately turns his apprentice into a political operator, because that is exactly what Darth Plagueis did to Darth Sidious 
when he was young and became the senator for Naboo. But there was another more secret benefit for having Dooku as his apprentice, and that has a lot to do with Dooku's previous master, who was Yoda. If there was one person that scared Palpatine more than anyone in the galaxy, it was Master Yoda. In a fair fight, one could even argue that Yoda was more powerful than Darth Sidious. And as the leader of the Jedi Order, this means that containing Yoda and keeping him unaware of his plans is incredibly important. Now remember, Palpatine was playing an incredibly dangerous game with the Jedi. When he became Chancellor of the Republic, he essentially had daily meetings with the Jedi High Council and had to work hard to conceal his own presence in the Force by using an ability known as Force Clouding, where you basically suck the dark side forces into yourself and hold it there so it can't be detected. This is the main reason why Palpatine always looks constipated when he's the Chancellor. He's basically trying his best not to rip dark side ass around Mace Windu for several years. That sounds super stressful. Anyway, no matter how much uh, Palpatine uses force clouding, he's not gonna be able to hide his entire Sith brand plan. I mean, the Sith were active for decades, centuries, using their lobbying groups to kind of like mess with things in the outer rim. And so their fingerprints were all over the place. I mean, think about it. All throughout the prequel trilogy, there were plenty of moments where Palpatine and the Sith were almost revealed. Yeah, the malfunctioning inhibitor chips. I was framed because I know the truth. The truth about a plot. A massive deception. By who? Well, there's a sinister plot in the works against the Jedi. You had ambitious apprentices. What if I told you that the Republic was now under the control of the Dark Lord of the Sith? No, that's not possible. You had loose ends that you didn't properly tie down. My investigation of the bounty hunter Jango Fett led to Kamino. The Kaminoans recounted that it was Jedi Master Cypher Dias who ordered the production of a clone army. Without the consent of the Council or the Senate, he did this. You also had extremely astute Jedi who just instinctively smelled the rot coming from beneath Palpatine's robes. I sense a plot to destroy the Jedi. The dark side of the Force surrounds the Chancellor. And on top of that, from a strategic level, the war didn't really make that much sense. The Separate Destroyed Army was 10 to 20 times larger than the Clone Army at the outset of the war, yet there was never a decisive push to the core of the galaxy during this time period. The point is, no matter how careful you are, once you activate a plan of this scale that involves so many people, it's gonna be almost impossible to keep everyone silent. And so what does Palpatine do to further hide his true intentions? Well, it's basically what any intelligence agency does when they have a piece of information that gets leaked out there that they wanna control. You can't really just crack down and suppress that information because it's out there. You know, it only looks suspicious if you do something like that. So instead, what you do is you flood the internet, the hollow net, with all sorts of crazy wild information, conspiracy theory, leaked documents, all sorts of unrelated things to confuse the crap out of everyone so that no one knows what is true and what is not. That's the key. And the Sith achieved this in a few ways. First, we have Darth Plagueis and Darth Sidious meddling with the balance of the Force and using the dark side to directly cloud the vision of the Jedi. Something that Yoda complained about frequently. Mm, the dark side clouds everything. Impossible to see. Mm, clouded this boy's future is. The shroud of the dark side has fallen. Begun. The Clone War has. On top of dealing with this dark side shroud, you know, basically covering everything. Yoda also was the Grand Master of the Jedi Order, which was engaged in his first war in a thousand years. I mean, this means on top of his normal duties, like meeting with the High Council to determine the direction of the Jedi, training younglings in lightsaber techniques, Yoda now also was a military commander who had a focus on strategic and even tactical aspects of the battles he was involved in. Meanwhile, he also had to maintain a relationship between the federal government and his order. Grandmaster Yoda was an exceptional Jedi. He was a once in a generation talent. He was also close to a thousand years old, so he had access to a whole lot of experience and knowledge. I mean, this is why he was able to take on so many tasks and not be overwhelmed. But even for him, this was a lot. And this was kind of all a part of Palpatine's plan, attack Yoda from every direction, make him so confused and busy that he won't know what is going on. Now, Yoda is generally an ocean of calm. Not many things can stir a extreme reaction from him. But if there's one connection a Jedi holds dear more than anything else in life, it's the connection between a master and an apprentice. And by targeting Yoda's own former apprentice Count Dooku and turning him into the dark side, Palpatine had the final piece of the puzzle, a direct link to his hated 
in Feud Enemy. At first, Dooku's departure saddened Yoda. Remember, Dooku didn't blast his way out of the Jedi Temple using Force Lightning, uh, you know, holding a Jedi youngling as a human shield in the other hand. He left on good terms. Even though he was gone, the Jedi still had a lot of respect for him. Remember when Padme accused Dooku of trying to assassinate her on Coruscant? I think the Count Dooku was behind it. He is a political idealist, not a murderer. You know, my lady, Count Dooku was once a Jedi. Although Yoda says nothing here, Mace Windu and Kia D. Mundi step in for their boss and defend their former colleague. This would have been a huge deal at the time. I mean, I mean, think about the ramifications if Yoda's own apprentice turned to the dark side and started a separatist movement. This is Yoda, leader of the Jedi Order. There would definitely be some questions of his abilities and where his loyalties lie. And so the Jedi Yoda included choose to believe that Dooku was just some politician. And of course, this belief is colored by bias. When it was finally revealed that Dooku was behind the Confederacy of Invented Systems and had turned to the dark side, Yoda initially didn't have much time to think about it because he was busy trying to bring the JR into play on Geonosis. And so even when Yoda confronts Dooku at the end of the battle, it's mostly all business. There's no mention of their former relationship. Instead, Dooku approaches the battle with arrogance and confidence, and Yoda is just grim and serious. He's ready to show Dooku his true power. And I think at this point, Yoda sees Dooku as just the Sith, kind of like how Obi-Wan Kenobi can view Darth Vader and Anakin Skywalker as almost completely different people. But this type of compartmentalizing only works for so long, your mind will eventually slip and the, the power of nostalgia in past events can be overwhelming. And in moments of weakness, Yoda will remember Dooku. In Legends, Dooku even reaches out secretly to Yoda during the Clone Wars and presents him with a small message and a gift that has significant meaning for both of them when they were master and apprentice. Yoda would actually meet up with his old Padawan at his castle on Serrano and he would try to convince Dooku to come back to the light. Remember, the Jedi had emotions just like the rest of us, and no matter how hard they try to suppress those emotions or keep them from affecting their judgment, those emotions still bled through sometimes. And when you're in a position as important as Yoda, that is a complete liability. Especially when the person you're thinking about is the leader of the enemy faction. Palpatine understood this fact and tried to exploit it as much as possible. And he really needed to do this fast because by the last year of the war, the Jedi were really, really close to figuring out the entire plot. No, now we do. That guide the creation of the clones from the beginning. Dooku did. Hmm. Our enemy created an army for us. And just weeks earlier, a clone trooper by the name of Tup had gone into a weird trance in the middle of a battle and executed his own general. Good soldiers follow orders. Good soldiers follow orders. Good soldiers follow orders. Good soldiers follow orders. I mean, they even found a biological chip implanted in his head and all of the clones' heads. And in the first year of the war during their ambush on Ragosa, while meditating, Yoda sends the future one of the clones with him named Jek. At the moment, Order 66 is issued. Yoda senses Jek's emotions change from disbelief to regret to immediate obedience. I mean, it's not all that difficult for Yoda to just connect some of these dots, right? Well, Yoda has always been wary of prophecies and visions. Knowledge of the future can create fear and reactionary behavior that might cause even more problems. I mean, you guys remember the scene where Anakin goes to Yoda for advice about the visions he's having of Padme dying? Remember what Yoda said to him? I won't let these visions come true, Master Yoda. Death is a natural part of life. Rejoice for those around you who transform into the Force. Mourn them do not. Miss them do not. This conversation between Yoda and Anakin happens directly after Anakin kills Dooku. And so Yoda is not just talking to Anakin here about Padme. In a way, Yoda is also dealing with the death of Dooku and trying to make sense of everything and comfort himself. Just months earlier, Yoda had been sent on a spiritual quest by the voice of Qui-Gon Jinn. Yoda would travel to many different planets, including Dagobah, Moribund, and the Wellspring of Life. And he would have many important visions along the way that were supposed to guide his decision making and allow him to eventually train to become one with the Force. In one of the visions, we see Yoda envisioning an alternate timeline where Dooku hasn't fallen to the dark side. Although he is wary of what the hell is going on, he seems to be eager to believe that the situation he is in is true. Yes, Master. I was telling them the tale of when you faced the giant Tarentatek on Kashyyyk. What a terrible beast it was. Yes. Yes. I mean, just before Yoda had defeated his own dark side, but whenever Dooku shows up, it seems to make Yoda pause. Now, Yoda does eventually figure out that this whole thing is a vision, and he wakes up. 
dead I know you to be. On Naboo, died you did, qui -Gon. And a traitor you are, my old Padawan. This is basically the false sweetness of nostalgia. But luckily, an inability to cope with the truth is not something Yoda struggles with. But what this vision also does is it closes Yoda's mind to the previous vision he had and the truth it told. This was a much darker version of the Jedi Temple. All the Jedi are lying dead on the floor and Yoda is unable to help anyone. What has happened here, Padawan? <coughs> Who has done this? <coughs> Now, this scene can be interpreted as Yoda being guilty over not protecting Ahsoka from accusations that she had bombed the Jedi Temple. But there were other dead Jedi lying around Yoda as well, further signs of his failure to act and stop the impending doom that was about to engulf the Jedi. Remember, Tup's inhibitor chip, the sketchy circumstances surrounding Cypher Deus's death, and of course the knowledge that the clone army was built by the Sith. There are more than enough pieces to help Yoda confirm what was about to happen, but it was this vision of Dooku that would distract him from what he actually needed to do. When Yoda arrives on Moraban, the final step in his trial to start training how to become one with the Force, this very important moment actually alerts Dooku, who still has a very strong master-Padawan relationship with Yoda. Palpatine would actually use this connection to infiltrate the mind of Yoda and interrupt his last few trials. And this was done using the blood of Count Dooku and some weird Sith alchemy. Now, Palpatine tries to break Yoda's ideology in this next vision. He and Dooku will confront Yoda and Anakin Skywalker on Coruscant. Anakin manages to defeat Count Dooku and disobeys Yoda and executes him in the same way he does in real life just a few weeks later. And when that happens a few weeks later, well, I feel like that's, that should have been confirmation to Yoda that these visions he was having were a lot more truthful than he realized. But of course, he doesn't want to believe these visions. By the end of this vision quest, Yoda is faced with a choice. Anakin Skywalker has been knocked out and was in an extremely vulnerable situation. Yoda had caught him in the Force with one hand and was trying to fight off Palpatine with the other. Now, Palpatine wanted Yoda to give up on Anakin in order to destroy him. It's the same setup that Palpatine oftentimes uses with other Force users like Luke Skywalker and Rey later on. And Yoda almost does it. Remember, his previous vision with Dooku was all about not dwelling on the past, not getting attached to other people, letting go of Dooku, letting go of Anakin. But that's not what happens. Yoda is aware of Palpatine's manipulations and he defeats this vision as well. But by defeating this vision, he also forgets all of the truth that was hidden in all of these visions. Dooku was really just the last piece that Palpatine needed. And these distractions in the last year of the war were what ultimately made Yoda unable to fight back. Lastly, guys, I want to remind you that every Padawan is actually hand-selected by their master for a specific reason. They see something valuable in their Padawans. Well, actually, I do have to say that during the Clone Wars, uh, Padawans were assigned. Ahsoka was assigned to Anakin because there was no time. But generally speaking, Padawans are chosen by their masters. This is a selection process. Now, Yoda has trained in excess of 20,000 Jedi throughout his entire career, but he's only taken a few Padawan on throughout that career as well. And, you know, being a Padawan is very different from just being trained by Master Yoda and how to use the lightsaber, right? And the reason why Grand Master Yoda had stopped taking on apprentices before Count Dooku was because he was the Grand Master. You simply just don't have enough time to devote yourself to an apprentice. And so Count Dooku was always a very special case for Yoda. He had seen something extremely special in this youngling and he wanted to shape his life. In some ways, I guess, Master Yoda forgot about the Jedi's uh, biggest weakness and that is uh, attachments. Because when you become attached to a person, it can become a weakness that is exploited by your enemies. And that is exactly what Palpatine did. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. I'll see you next time.
Before we continue, I got an amazing deal from our sponsor for today's video, ownersaber.com. Right now, it's buy one, get one free, as in buy one Padawan Saber, and you'll get an additional Padawan Saber for free, as long as they're both the same model and have the same soundboard. This amazing deal ends on April 7th, so act quick. For those of you who don't know, ownersaber.com has a wide selection of awesome looking replica lightsabers from all of your favorite characters, plus many original designs. And they are always updating their inventory, and recently they just added the brick bundle which features the Lego-inspired brick saber and comes with a scabbard and display stand. Check out the link down below for more information. And if you guys aren't interested in the pad one buy one get one free deal, then you can still use our promo code. That's uh, TECH, all caps, for an additional 20% off. Thank you for your patience. On to the rest of the video.